Amen. Thank you for that, Mrs. Hosey. The music uh, program has been a blessing tonight, and it's certainly been an encouragement to me, and uh, certainly enjoyed the uh, special music, whether the instrumentals or the, uh, the vocals. If you have your Bibles tonight, let's take them and go to the Old Testament book of Judges. Uh, Judges chapter number 17 is where we'll find our text this evening. And of course, we have been walking uh, through this book of Judges together on Wednesday night, and uh, really since the beginning of last year. And so uh, I believe this is message number 18. Of course, I'm not preaching every Wednesday night, nor have I over the past year. Uh, but um, we come now to the 17th chapter of the, of the book of Judges. And uh, to be very honest with you, the judges that most of us are familiar with and are aware of, uh, that we just have a surface knowledge of, we have, we have passed all of them. Uh, think about men like Gideon, men like Jephthah, uh, men like uh, Samson. And, uh, and we now move into somewhat of a more obscure uh, area of this book, and, uh, but, but certainly, um, certainly kind of carries with it the same theme of what's been happening in the nation of Israel throughout the period of the Judges. And that is just a lot of turmoil, a lot of uh, wickedness and idolatry, and really some things that, you know, as God's people, we just kind of shake our heads at and, uh, and are amazed that, uh, that, that God's children would participate in some of these things. Well, the, the real spirit of this age is captured in the sixth verse of the 17th chapter. And so that will be the, uh, the text that we'll have for tonight. And, uh, and so if you'll follow along with me there in verse number six, the Bible says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now this will become a popular refrain throughout the remainder of this book. We'll find this phrase several times. In those days there was no king. There was no leader. Uh, there, was, uh, there was no one who would, would stand up and take the lead. And as a result, every man did that which is right in his own eyes. The title of the message tonight is just simply, Every Man a King. Every Man a King. I apologize that we do not have uh, the screen uh, available. That is my fault. Uh, I had saved it, and I never emailed it to where it needs to go. And I apologize for that. It didn't dawn on me until I arrived here tonight that I had made that mistake. So forgive me. You'll just have to listen along like we did in the old days, all right? All right. Every man a king. Well, let's consider this thought here. There was no king. So every man basically set himself up as a king. And whatever pleased him, whatever he wanted, whatever he thought was good, then he did. And we're going to see how that plays out. We're going to see it specifically in the life of a man by the name of Micah. Micah, the story is found beginning in verse number 1 of chapter 17. There was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. So we're introduced to this man in this uh, chapter. And a uh, few things about his story that you need to know. We're going to kind of walk through these things. And then we're going to share with you uh, some things that you can expect when every man is a king. Uh, first of all, we notice here that Micah's story involves the fact that he stole 1,100 shekels of silver from his own mother. We learned of that in verse number 2. The Bible says, And he said unto his mother, The 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursedst and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. I guess confession really is good for the soul. And so we find here, we're introduced to this man, Micah, and the very first thing, that he does is he admits or he confesses, Mom, you know the 1,100 shekels of silver that you were so upset about, you were uh, cursing the fact that you had lost them, and you spoke about this in mine ears. Well, I just want you to know I took it, and I'm here, and I'm returning it back to you. So this, this is Micah. Notice uh, Micah's mother, according to verse number 4, uh, had dedicated her life's savings uh, for a specific purpose. Notice the purpose in verse number four. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder, who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And, uh, and so the money is, is returned back, and she says, look, Micah, here's what I was planning on doing with that money. I was going to give it to you for the purpose that we might fashion our own images, our own idols, that we might worship here uh, in our home. So this was the purpose to which she had set aside 1,100 shekels of silver. Now notice the Bible tells us that Micah, after the, the graven images were formed, had a house or a portion of his own house transformed into a temple filled with these idols 
and false gods. Look again in verse number five. It says, And the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. And, uh, and so we find just a lot of problematic things happening here in the life of Micah. We find that he steals from his mother. We find that his mother uh, is grateful that he gives the money back. And she says, here's why we save the money so that we can create these gods. The gods are created. And Micah takes either a house or a portion of his own house. And he sets up all of these, all of these things. And, uh, and, and, it, and he turns his own house into his own temple. And then the Bible says that he consecrates one of his own sons to be the priest in that temple. And, uh, and again, this is obviously not at all what God intended should take place. We also learn in verse number five that he borrows from the true worship, or excuse me, the true form of worship in the actual tabernacle uh, to be used in his own temple. And that is the, the symbolic ephod uh, that is spoken of here in verse number five. And then we find in verses 7 through 13, he, you know, he eventually lets his own son go from being priest, and he finds an actual Levite of the tribe of Levi who is part of the priesthood in the nation of Israel. That's the design. And he hires him to be his own personal priest and believes because of this that he will be blessed by God. Um, even though everything here he's doing is wrong, um, man, when you're a king in your own eyes, and every man is a king, well, then everything's right, and everything's fine, and everything's good. And he's creating, essentially, he's creating his own rules. He's created his own religion, and he is full steam ahead. It's all about him and what pleases him. And so we see here the lies. We see the stealing. We see the idolatry. We see the priests for hire. All of these things are critical elements that describe the wickedness and debauchery at this time in Israel, and really what describe what happens when every man becomes his own king? You see, with no true leader, no king, no judge, no prophet, the people all go their own way. And they begin to do their own thing. And so this void in leadership creates a vacuum that is filled by every man operating as the king of his own life and his own family. And so I want us to walk through this passage together and I want us to consider what happens when every man is his own king. I want you to consider several things. Number one, when every man is king, things of value are devalued. We learn of that in this passage of Scripture. When every man is his own king, things that should be valuable are no longer valued. They are devalued. I want us to consider a couple of things specifically from this story that I believe are devalued. Number one, I would say integrity is devalued when every man is his own king. You see, when every man is his own king, then he makes his own rules. In many cases, there are no rules. Whatever pleases me, whatever I feel like doing at that certain point in time, and oftentimes we understand that integrity requires us to do the hard thing, to do the right thing. And when we set ourselves up as our own king, well, I don't want to do the hard thing. I'm the king. I shouldn't have to do hard things. I should do what pleases me. I should do what I like. And, and the story is introduced to us with the fact that Micah admits to his mother that he had stolen her life savings. I, 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 to me, it's inconceivable that a man would steal from what we would presume to be his elderly mother. There's no, there's no indication that, uh, that his mother even has a, has a husband that's still alive. That, that, she is, that she is a widow and that he thought in his mind, hey, I can just take this large sum of money and do what I want to with it or at least take it and intend to spend it on myself. But that's what happens when every man is his own king. Because when I, when I look at myself and I say nothing will be withheld from me, I'm the king of my life, no one can tell me what to do, then all of a sudden, hey, what's yours can become mine. Because I deserve it more than you because I'm the king of my own life. And we see here that integrity is devalued when every man is his own king. We see here that he had held on to what he had stolen even after hearing how distraught his mother was over the whole ordeal. He comes to her, he says, Mother, do you remember? Do you remember the 1,100 shekels of silver about which thou cursedst and spakest of also in mine ears? Some Bible scholars believe that she, she um, sus suspected him of having stolen it. Because it seems like she makes it loudly known in his ears, somebody took this money 
you know, where is it at? You know, with this kind of idea of thinking that he was probably the one who had made off with it based on perhaps his reputation, the way that he conducted himself. But here is this woman who is distraught over losing 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, you're going you're, you're to think, well, 1,100 pieces of silver, what, is, what does that mean? We're going to get to that in just a moment. But it was a lot of money. And, 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 and here is this woman who is, who is weeping and crying and who is cursing over the fact that she has lost this money and she is letting him know, and yet he holds on to it. Why? Because it's my, it's my money. I can do whatever I want to with it. I'm my own king. I deserve this. This is owed to me. And the Bible speaks specifically about the importance of laboring for that which we have. In other words, a man of true integrity would never steal because he understands that that's a violation of Scripture and he understands that's not what God intended. It breaks God's law. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. I love the simplicity of scripture. I mean, it just comes right out and just says, look, if you're in the habit of stealing, quit it. Just knock it off. And if, and if you need something, then go out and use your own hands and labor for it that you might have that which you need. I mean, that's just, that's just plain scripture. That's just simple stuff. That's not beating around the bush. If you're in the habit of stealing, knock it off. And look, we, 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 stealing can take all, take all different forms in today's day and age. I mean, there's lots of, there's lots of ways that, that, that people steal, whether it's, you know, downloading something that you didn't pay for, or whether it's, you know, just uh, kind of taking something from work that isn't, isn't yours to take. And, and, uh, and, and it, again, it can take a lot of different forms. And there's, there's an essence, you know, there's an essence, a lot of people that think, well, it's really not that big of a deal. I mean, there are people, maybe even sitting in this very room tonight, who will go to a restaurant, you'll order some water, and then you'll go to the pop machine. And you'll fill up with, you'll, you'll get Sprite because it's got to be clear, you know. You can't, uh, you know, you, you, and, and you're, you're one step ahead of the people that are, uh, that are might, be, might be following up on what you're doing. And, and I'm, here to, I'm here to tell you something. According to the Bible, that's wrong. To be a man of integrity, I'd say, that's stealing. I didn't pay for that. I shouldn't have that. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands. But listen, when every man is a king, things that are of great value, men of integrity, they're devalued. There aren't very many of those when every man is king. Because every man thinks, I can do whatever I want to. I can have whatever I should have. Notice, secondly, not only is integrity devalued, but I, I see here that financial stewardship is devalued. Notice verse number three. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. So, Mom, here's the 1,100 shekels of silver back. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Now, I want, I want you to know what I've been saving this for my whole life. I'm saving it. I'm giving it to the Lord. And that sounds really good, doesn't it? I mean, we're off to a great start. She's dedicated and consecrated this sum of money unto the Lord. But notice she says, but here's what we're going to do with it. It's to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it. I'll give it back unto you. And you make this or you get this made. And, and this is really what the purpose of it was for to begin with. Now, 1,100 shekels of silver was a great sum of money. Later in this passage, we'll get to this in a moment, but Micah hires a man for just 10 shekels of silver per year. And that is an agreeable sum. The man doesn't bat his eye at that. Sounds like, well, that, that sounds like a good deal to me. Ten shekels per year. She has, she has scrimped and she has saved and she has scrounged and she has, you know, probably been somewhat tight-fisted that she might be able to save 1,100 shekels of silver when the going rate would have been probably ten shekels of silver a year. She has come upon this great sum of money and what does she plan to do with it? Is she going to invest in real estate? Is she going to, you know, to, uh, to give it to the tabernacle in the service of the Lord? Is she going to start a business? No, no, I'm going to take all of this money and I want to, I want to make some graven images and some molten images. <laughs> I mean, I, I think to myself, what, what poor financial stewardship, but that's what happens when every man is his own king. We completely disregard what the Bible says. We do things that are foolish and that don't even make any sense whatsoever. And we see here that things of great value are devalued when every man sits on the own throne of his own life. 
We make decisions that are foolish, short-sighted, selfish, uh, covetous, when we are our own king. Can I, so, can I show you secondly that when every man is king, not only are things of value devalued, but when every man is king, God's word is dismissed. We see that really throughout this whole story, but specifically in verses 4 through 10. Notice, first of all, that Micah violated the clear commands of Scripture, and so did his mother in many respects. We find in verses 4 and 5 that he took the money and that they gave it to a founder or someone who was capable of, of, uh, of carving these images, and they made a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah, and Micah had a house of God's. And we see here that God's word says in Exodus chapter number 20, verses 3 to 5, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. So we find here that when every man is king, well, we can just, we can just get rid of the Bible. We can dismiss this. We don't, we don't need God's word anymore. We're just going to do our own thing. We want to we wanna violate the commands, the clear commands of Scripture, then we can do so. Notice, secondly, not only did he violate the clear commands of Scripture, but he took items used in the true worship of God and used them for his own purposes. In verse number five, the Bible talks about how he made an ephod. That may not mean anything to you, but the ephod was a vestment worn by the high priest. It was commanded by God to be created in Exodus chapter number 28, verses 4 and verse number 6. Throughout, throughout the history of the children of Israel, the ephod was worn by men like Aaron, Samuel, and even David. The ephod was used as an oracle or a way uh, to obtain God's word or revelation. We read of that in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 7 and 8. When David gathers the ephod and he says, shall, shall we go up and shall we pursue after them? They're at Ziklag, and the revelation comes to them. Go, up, go, go after, up after them, and you will pursue after them, and you shall surely capture and regain all that you have lost. Word comes directly from the Lord. And we see here that uh, this character by the name of Micah says, well, in the, in the actual tabernacle there in Shiloh, the high priest wears this ephod, and so if I'm going to have my own temple, and if I'm going to have my own house of worship, well, then I need an ephod as well. Here, here's, here's what's happening in essence. Micah is mixing the true worship of God with false or worldly worship. He's combining the two. He's bringing the two together. You say, well, is that really that big of a deal? Well, according to the Bible, it is. God's judgment and his wrath are poured out on such things. Listen, what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter number 22 and verse number 26. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. In other words, there's, there's no business for an, an ephod, uh, an oracle of God. There's no, there's, there, there's no reason for that to appear in this house filled with false gods. Uh, there, there's, there's no excuse for you to borrow something that is to be used in the true worship of Almighty God that God has commanded and that God has prescribed and use it in a, in a house in which you violated God's other laws. Yet yeah, that's exactly what Micah does. You say, well, does it, really, does it really matter? Well, here's what God says, because God's priests and, her, and his prophets had profaned the holy uh, with the un unholy, the holy and the profane. Notice he says, therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. I want you to notice, thirdly, we consider here that God's word was dismissed not only in the creation of this ephod and in violating the clear commands of Scripture, but notice thirdly that, that ultimately Micah hires a man who is consecrated to serve the Lord for his own purposes. In verses 10 through 13, we find that a, uh, that a man of the tribe of Levi is sojourning, and he happens across this man by the name of Micah. The Bible says in verse number 9, And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite. Of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals. So the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. We see here that this Levite had fallen on hard times. God had warned his people about forsaking the Levites. We find that in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse number 19. 
But the Bible says, take heed to thyself that thou forsake not the Levite as long as thou livest upon the earth. You see, all of the tribes of Israel were given land. They were given an inheritance in Israel except for the Levites. They weren't given any land. The Lord was their inheritance. And they were to serve him in the, in the worship of God. And they were to live off of the offerings that would, uh, that would come in. And, and, and so God specifically said, but don't you forget about the Levites. It might be easy to do when you get into your nice homes and your nice regions and you build your cities. May you remember the Levites and not forget about them. And so this man in his quest for a home and provision, after having left Bethlehem Judah, his past cross with Micah, they run into each other. And the Levites had been chosen by God to be his and to minister in his service according to Numbers chapter number 3. That's what it says in verse number 12. And I, behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. By finding a Levite to minister in his temple, Micah actually believed that he would have the blessing of the Lord upon him. In other words, he, he's violating all these other clear scriptural commands, but he thinks, well, because I have an actual Levite to be my priest, God's going to be okay with this. You see what happens when every man is his own king? You see what happens when there are no rules, when we create the rules kind of on the fly? We do what just kind of pleases us or what we think kind of makes sense in our minds? And so we see here that when every man is king, uh, the word of God is dismissed. When every man is king, things of great value are devalued. And finally, when every man is king, we find even spiritual leaders lack discernment. We learn of that in this, in this specific young man who is a Levite, consecrated to the Lord's service and the Lord's work. Notice the Bible says in verse number 11 of chapter 17, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man. See that he was content to dwell in this arrangement. He he too saw no problem with leaving the work that God had called him to in order that he might be a man's hireling. Presumably this man had perhaps spent some time in Shiloh. He had been to the tabernacle. He had seen the way that God had prescribed for the worship to go forth. Now he walks into the house of Micah. Perhaps he sees candles that are burning and he sees false gods created out of silver and, 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 and wood and he sees people coming in and he sees them bowing down before these gods and here's a man who should know better. Here's, here's a man who is, who, is, who is part of the tribe that God has commissioned and commanded to carry out his worship in the tabernacle and even he's content to go forward in this. Yeah, this will be just fine. I mean, after all, this guy's giving me a place to live. He's giving me 10 shekels of silver every year. He's giving me food to eat. He's giving me uh, one new suit of apparel every single year. And re remember, every man is his own king, so I've got to look out for my needs. I've got to take care of myself, and no one else is taking care of me, so this will have to do. We see here, not only was he content to dwell in this arrangement, notice he counseled based on what people wanted to hear. In the next chapter, in chapter number 18, we find that the tribe of Dan is on their way to expand the territory that they had been given. They had been given some land, but it wasn't enough for them. They were longing for more land, and so they're on their way to spy out some land in the north. That's where they would eventually settle. And as they're making their way there, the Bible tells us that they happen across Micah's path, and they come into this house, this temple, and they see these false gods that are there, and they find this priest, and they said, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm, I'm the priest here. And notice what, what takes place in verse number five. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says, and they said unto him, ask counsel, we pray thee, of God, that we may know whether our way which we go shall be prosperous. So they say to this priest, well, you're a priest. So why don't you go to God and why don't you ask him if this is going to work out well for us? Are we going to be able to uh, conquer this land, conquer this new territory? Is everything going to work out? Notice his answer in verse number six. And the priest said to them, go in peace. Before the Lord is your way wherein ye go. Now, we don't find this priest. We don't find him falling down on his face before God. We don't find him seeking God's counsel whatsoever. We find him looking at these five men from the tribe of Dan. They've explained where they're going and what they're doing. And he's assuming these guys want to hear that everything's going to be fine. So I'm going to tell them it's going to be fine. Go in peace. Everything's great. Has he actually received this word from the Lord? No. How could he possibly? He's a false priest. 
He's a false prophet. He is not a man who has been blessed by God, and yet he simply tells them what they want to hear. Now, this is especially dangerous for a forward path eventually is going to require a battle. And the potential for men's lives to be lost based upon this counsel that we would all recognize as very, very reckless. In other words, if you came to me and you said, Pastor Pete, I'm, I'm trying to make a decision, um, and here's, here's, what I, here's what I think I'm going to do, here's what I want to do, would you pray about this decision? If I just looked at you and I just said, I don't need to pray about it, you, you go ahead and do it. That, that makes sense. I, I think you would probably be like, well, I'm asking you to pray about it. I'm not, ask, I'm not necessarily asking you to tell me what to do. Just pray about it. By, by the way, we live in a day and age in which you can go to God yourself. You're your own priest. You, you don't have to come to me. Now, I'm happy to bear your burdens with you. I'm happy to pray with you. And that's a privilege of mine and an honor for me to do so. But the truth of the matter is you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He is your guide just as much as he's my guide. And so we're living in a day and age in which we don't have to go and find an ephod to get an oracle from God. We have his word for us here. We can, we can bow down our own knees before God and we can pray. But I'm just simply saying that we, we've got to be leery. We've got to be careful about surrounding ourselves with people who just tell us what we want to hear. And that's the type of counselor this false priest was. Notice finally, thirdly, he chose to leave Micah and to be priest to the tribe of Dan based upon more prestige. Go with me a little bit further in chapter number 18 and look in verse number 18. They, they, they gathered 600 men to go to war. They went up, they spied the land, came back and said, hey, this guy's told us everything's going to be good, so let's get our 600 men and we're going to go up and we're going to fight and we're going to take some more land. And on their way up to battle, notice the Bible says in verse number 18, and these went un, into Micah's house and fetched the carved image, the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. Then said the priest unto them, what do ye? And they said unto him, hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth and go with us and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man or that thou be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. And he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went in the midst of the people. These guys come to him and they give him an offer that he cannot refuse. And he says, so long to Micah, I'm out of here because I've got a better opportunity. I've got more people that I can lord over and that I can rule over. I've got, a, I've got a bigger responsibility, a bigger opportunity. This is going to be better for my career. Remember, remember, this is what happens when every man is a king. Do we seek God's counsel? Do we seek God's word or do we just dismiss it? Do we just disregard it? Do we devalue things that are of great value? Do we, uh, do we uh, lack discernment? That's what happens when every man is his own king. Let me just finish with just a few key takeaways and we'll be done. Can I say this, no, number one? Even when there is a clear leader in place, make sure you are ultimately following God and his word. In other words, we're looking at this and we're saying, well, this is what happened because there was no king, there was no ruler, there was no leader. But I'm here to tell you that even when there is a, even when there is a leader in place, you make sure you get in this book and you know that I'm doing what God wants me to do. There, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of Christians who cannot think for themselves. They're simply content just to allow the pastor to think for them. They're content to allow some, you know, some internet blogger to think for them, some internet pastor to think for them. Well, he said it, it must be right. And I'm, I'm here to tell you the Bible, the Bible commands us, instructs us to get into God's word ourselves and to figure out what does this book say. Now, I'm thankful that, that, that you come and I'm thankful that you... Uh, that, 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 you, that you're here to listen, but I'm also here to tell you that, that that's not sufficient. That, that I think God's plan and God's will is for all of us to go to our homes and in our daily lives and for us to study this book ourselves and for us to live according uh, to, to this book. Uh, Paul wrote to the church at Galatia and he said in, 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 in verses six through uh, nine of chapter number one, he says, look, even, he says, if you hear another gospel from even me, he said, you disregard it completely. He said, you, you, you only listen to what has already been revealed to you through the pages of Scripture. And I'm here to tell you that, that, that if at some point in the future I stand in front of you or some other man stands up here in front of you or some Sunday school teacher or some deacon stands and they say something that is contrary to that book, you have every right to tell them, hey, listen, you're wrong. The, this Bible is what we're going to base our lives upon. Even when there's a clear leader in place, you make sure 
I make sure that we are ultimately, that we are following God. Not that we're just following some man, just meandering through life. What does this guy have to say? We better make sure that we're following God. Number two, number two, let me say this, value, integrity, and character above everything else. In this life, may we value integrity and character above everything else. The Bible says in Psalm chapter number 37 and verse number 23, now the scriptures say this, it says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Are you a good man? Are, are you walking with God? Are your steps ordered by the Lord? Or are you like Micah and like the residents of Israel during this time, are you just doing that which is right in your own eyes? Every man, his own king. Can I say thirdly, expect those without integrity to surround themselves with others who have no integrity. Micah is a man with, with zero integrity whatsoever. And what does he do? He hires a, he hires a priest who is just like him. And the, first, the first chance this guy gets, he's going to bolt for a better opportunity. This man's just going to tell everybody what they want to hear, not what they need to hear, what the Bible says. This man is con content to dwell in a situation that is absolutely wrong. And that's the bottom line, is that when you are a man of integrity or a woman of, in, uh, of integrity, uh, then you're going to surround yourself with people like that. And if you're someone who is lacking in that, you're going to find yourself surrounding yourself with people like that. The Bible talks about a companion of fools. A companion of fools. Let me say finally, and we'll be done tonight. People without integrity will eventually be destroyed as they surround themselves with others who have no integrity. The end of that verse, Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 20 says, the companion of fools shall be destroyed. And we find here that this whole situation that Micah had built, this temple and his own hired priest, all of it was snatched away from him. When the tribe of Dan came, every man does that which is right in his own eyes, every man a king, stole all of his idols, stole the ephod, stole the teraphim, and eventually even stole his own hired priest. And that is, all, listen, that is always the end result when people lack integrity and they surround themselves with other people who lack integrity, you mark it down, destruction is going to be the inevitable result. So may God help us. We're living in a day and age that is eerily similar to what's happening here in the book of Judges. And there, there's, there's very little leadership in our society, in our culture. Pretty much every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. And truth is subjective, and who are you to tell me what I should be doing, what I shouldn't be doing? And, uh, you know, truth is relative, and I'm going to make my own rules, and I'm going to live my own way. And this is the world that we're living in. And may God help us not to adapt to the spirit of the age like the children of Israel did in Judges. And may God help us to stand up and be people of integrity and, and to allow the Lord to be the king of our lives. Allow this book, allow this book to dictate and control us, not us make our own rules and design our own way.